say that, <laughs> that my, my baby here wants a, she wants a husband. This is hypothetical, say. <laughs> Somebody said, mm -mm. <laughs> But let us say she really, really wants a husband. And she dreams that she was married. She have a dream that she's married. And she tell herself, God is going to give her a husband. God, and so when she talks to Dr. Leverage, she said, God, God, God told me he's going to give me a husband. She talked to Bishop Lona. God told me he's going to give me a husband. I don't know where he's coming from, how he's coming, but he coming. But God told me he's going to, now she had a dream that she was married. Hallelujah. But she said, God told her that she's going to get a husband. Now, every man that says hello <laughs> has become a potential candidate. Right? That's usually how it works. And especially the one that says, hello, how you doing? If he had that how you doing on it, he done already asked for it. He got an engagement ring in his hand. He about to come out with, glory to God, next to the marriage. They done walked down the aisle, everything done gone through her head. Just from that, how are you doing? So what is she living in? She's living in a hope that she created based upon a dream, not, but not, not something that God said. See, because if I dream something, I got to ask God, God, are you talking to me? Or is this my own heart or my own mind or the devil? And, and if God is talking to me, he needs to make himself plain. God is, doesn't, want us, doesn't want to say something to us that's ambiguous, that could go in, in it either way. It could be him or it could be the devil. No, if God is instructing us or comforting us, you're going to know that it's God. Are you hearing? So God would not leave her like that to, to wonder whether God was speaking to me or was this just a dream or, or what. God knows how to make himself known. And so God will make sure that she know that it's him. And if it's not him, he's not saying nothing about it. Or he may even let her know. I didn't, that was you, you just dreaming. You just ate too much kalaloo that night. Praise <laughs> you, Jesus. Glory to God. But she's walking around with that false hope. That hope that that man is coming, that he's coming, that he's coming, that he's coming. Now, Okay, you say, well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Her, it, let me show you what false hope is. This is the principle that's inside of false hope that creates a gulf between us and, and God because Christ doesn't do this. If her comfort, her comfort, listen to what I'm saying. If her comfort is found inside of believing that she's going to get a husband, that's false hope. Do you understand what I'm saying? If, her, if, she, if that's the only place she's comforted, she's comforted. In other words, no matter what's going on in her life, she only finds comfort in the fact that God has promised me a husband. Are you, are you understanding me? That's where her anxiety is relieved at. That's where her depression is relieved, supposedly. She's finding comfort in the fact that God has given me, has promised me a husband, even though God has not. It's her own mind. Now, listen to what I'm saying. If God says, Mary or Cynthia, if God had said, Cynthia, Jesus came through the door, walked in the office, and stood up in front of Cynthia and said, Cynthia, I'm going to send you a husband. Just wait. Stand still. I will send you a husband. If Jesus himself came in and said that. And all of after that, now it may take him five years to send him. In that space of time, from the time he said it, five years later, 
all hell is breaking loose in her territory sphere of influence. But the only comfort that she has is in the fact that God promised her a husband. Do you do, are you hearing me? The only comfort that she has is in the fact that God promised. All this hell is breaking loose for five years. And the only time that she has any peace is when she sit down and, and think on the fact that God promised me a husband. That's when she's comforted. That's when she has peace. That is sin. You say, well, how can, how can that be sin? Because she's being comforted in something God promised. Let me show you how it's sin. If all hell breaking loose in her, in her territory sphere of influence, and the only comfort she can get is the, is the idea of having a husband. That's where her comfort is. Her comfort is in, in the fact that, that, that whenever down the road God's going to send me a husband, that's the only time that she experiences peace and comfort. Something's wrong with that. Because if all hell is breaking loose, we're supposed to still have the joy, the peace, and the righteousness of the Holy Ghost. Our comfort is supposed to be in the Holy Ghost, not in the promise of flesh and blood. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So where am I? Where, where is she during that, during that, that five-year span? She's in the flesh. And that's why she has no comfort other than when she sit down and meditate on the fact that one day I'm going to have a husband. No, I got to function and occupy, hello, every day. Huh? I got to occupy every day. I've got to function every day. And I should be able to walk in the peace and the righteousness and the joy of God every day at every moment of the day. And I would if I were in the spirit. Are y'all hearing God? Are you hearing me? I'm trying to show us. Uh, what, what are you doing, Doc? I'm trying to show us how we think. And though the way we think is what's separating us from God. I'm trying to show you that the way we think is not Christ. It's not Christ. Because Christ is a comforter all day long, no matter what's going on, whether you have or have not. The Holy Ghost is a comforter. Whether we have or have not anything, are you hearing God? It's just like some people uh, binge. Uh, they, they call it, you know, they binge eating. They, they, just, they eat for comfort. They do comfort eating. What do you call it? Comfort food? They, they eat, just eat. For comfort. Huh? Eat for comfort. That's sin. That means that the Holy Spirit is not their comforter. Are you hearing God? God should be my comforter regardless of what's going on. God ought to be my comforter. And if God is not my comforter, I'm in sin. I'm not in the spirit. I am not in the spirit. Do you understand that? Hmm? And let me show you something. Let me show you something. Whew. I'm, trying to, I'm trying to narrow this guff down while we own the subject of men and husbands. Let me show you another sin or guff. Longing. Longing for what you don't have. Longing. People that long for what they don't have have no confidence in God. And they have no comfort for God, from God. Longing. Oh, God, if I only had this. Oh, God, if I only had that. Oh, God, if you would do this. I used to long for certain things. I used to long for certain things, Hope. Long for them. And, they, and, and I didn't understand why it was a sin because 
It wasn't anything sinful. And everything I longed for was for the ministry. I, I really rarely long for anything for myself. Most of what I want from God is for the ministry. 99.9% .9 of anything I want is for the ministry. Because I'm, fa I'm fine. But longing, longing, let me, let me deal with longing, what I mean by longing. Because you may have another definition, Miss Lifesaver. Amen. <laughs> but I'm talking about longing for something that you don't have. What does the word long mean? What does longing mean? Give me a definition, some of you scholars. A strong desire. What else? Yearning. Now, we, it's all right to have, it's lawful to have that for Christ. And longing to be a part of, you know, longing for Christ to return. Longing and yearning to be where God wants us to be. Nothing wrong with that. But when we long for stuff in this world, when we long after the things of this world, or we long after people, you know, to, uh, like husbands and wives, we... We're longing for a husband, longing for a wife, longing for money, longing for a car, longing for this, longing for that. Glory to God. Materialistic things. That's a sin. Because the scripture told us love not the world. And if I'm longing for something, I'm in love with that thing. I want that thing so badly. Are you hearing God? Hmm? Until I have evaded the comfort that the Holy Spirit gives. How do I know that? How do I know that I have evaded that? Because there is no contentment in me. When, 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 when is anxiety, exactly. I'm walking in anxiety. There's no contentment. When we are content in Christ, we don't long after the things of the world. Are you hearing God? When we're content in Christ, we don't long after the things of the world. Saints, are you seeing these gulfs? Yeah, but it's just the way we think. It's the way we think. And we can tell ourselves, you know, let me give you another one. There's a gulf that's created by lying to yourself. See, Christ is the spirit of truth. He's the spirit of truth. And we can lie to ourselves and say, oh, I'm fine. We're longing for things that we don't have. But we have that little religious spirit that says, I'm fine. And we talk all of that religious stuff. We talk, we talk a good game. And, we, and we, uh, we can work. We can do our little work in the church. You know, we working in the church and working, working, working. And, and faithful. And we just fine. We want everybody to feel that we are just fine. We want everybody to feel that we are just fine. There's nothing... We're longing after. But every now and then, sooner or later, that longing is going to surface. And you know where it normally surfaces at? In a conversation. In conversation. And the conversation may not be, may not directly say that I'm longing. But it does say it. That's the void that's in the conversation. You know, God told us to discern the void. Some of you that had thought war know what that means. We discern what a person is not saying just as well as what they are saying. Don't lie to yourself. How do you avoid that? 
always determine your spiritual location. And how do you do that? Judge your emotions. What are your emotions about a situation? Think on a situation. What are my true emotions? What do I truly feel? I've been telling you this for the last two years. November 29th makes two years I've been here. Mm -hmm. Almost two years now I've been telling you, judge your emotions. Judge them. How do you really feel about that situation or that thing? Hallelujah. Don't lie to yourself. If you're not in the spirit, say, I'm not in the spirit. I'm not walking after the spirit. I'm not walking after Christ. If that's reality, then state it as a reality. Because that's the only way you're going to correct yourself. You'll never correct yourself if you deny where you really are. Are you hearing God? How do you feel about people? This person, that person. How do you really feel? Because those emotions are what's causing that gulf. It's separating us from one another. I'm trying to, trying to break this lesson down to where it's very practical, saints. I want you to see these things that are separating us out. And, and, and you know what? Uh, the, the scripture says, so a man thinketh, so he is. And that's why I'm dealing with the way we think. The way we think, the things that's going on in our hearts. The things that are going on in our heart. Don't you ever think for one moment God doesn't know what's going on in your heart. Even if you never say it. God knows what's going on in your heart. He knows what you feel. He knows what your desires are. Are you hearing him? He knows. He knows. This great gulf. Hallelujah. Look at Romans 9 and... Six. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now this is important, saints. God spoke this to me when I was reading this. I was reading this and working on the study of God. God spoke to me. I had a visitation from Jesus while I was in the, while I was working on this study of God. Jesus stepped in my room. And he shared some things with me. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He answered some questions for me. Notice what this says, though. Uh, Pastor, read that sixth verse for me again. Romans 9 and 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, mm -hmm. for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. But they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Of Israel. Uh-huh. Read. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, this is important. As I, as I started to say earlier, this is very important because when the Lord, when the, the Lord visited me about this, he made it very clear to me. That, notice what he says here, not all that were of Israel, that's what he says, not all, they, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. And remember then, the Old Testament is supposed to be our schoolmaster. Not all are Israel which are of Israel. 
And not all are the children, even though they all have the seed of Abraham. Now, that's supposed to be our schoolmaster. What is he saying to us? In this, in this analogy here, Abraham is a type of God. He's, 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 this is shadows and types. Abraham is, represents God here. So now he's saying, now not all of them that come, all of them that are in the body of Christ, uh, even though they are of Christ, they are not considered Christ. That's important. That's important. That's important. Not all of them that were born again are considered Christ. They were. They have the seed in them. They were born of the Spirit. They were born of the Spirit. But what happened? They moved to walk. They elected to walk after the flesh. They did not walk after Christ. Are you hearing God? They did not walk after Christ. So yes, they were born again. But they didn't walk after Christ. They have the seed in them. But they didn't walk after Christ. So yes, many of God's children will end up in hell. Because he said, even though they have my seed, they're not my children. Come on, do you hear what he's saying? You heard what the scripture just said? They are not counted as children even though they have the seed. Why? Because they did the same thing Adam and Eve did. Here's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. God said, don't touch it, don't eat of it. And they touch and ate of it. Here is a born again son of God that God said, don't walk after the flesh. Don't, don't live unto your flesh. And we decide that we're going to live unto our flesh. So he says, even though my seed is in you, I don't count you as my child. You are a bastard. Are you hearing God? Now, my caution is don't die a bastard. This is something that. This is something that everybody in here better grab a hold of. Everybody, all, all of us. If you walk away from God, he might let you come back. Go to 2 Timothy, the second chapter, 20, 25th verse, I think it is. What does it say? Second Timothy 2, 25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, mm -hmm. if God, per adventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Now, it's, it says, instruct those that, are, that oppose themselves. See, there's some, there's some of us that are in God, all of us that are born of God, we have his seed in us, but we're opposing our own salvation. We work against ourselves. We have established these great gulfs that separate us from God. And it's the way we think, and it's the deeds that we do. We walk after the flesh. The flesh doesn't make us do anything. We decide that we want to reap unto our flesh. We want to live unto our flesh. I want to satisfy this. I want to satisfy my flesh in this. I want to satisfy my flesh with that. Glory to God. So he says, we all have the same seed. We're born again. But are we accounted as the children? He says, Timothy, I need you to teach them to stop opposing themselves. Whenever you sin against God, you're opposing yourself. Whenever you walk in unto the flesh, you're opposing yourself. Are you hearing God? Are you hearing me? 
Then notice what he says. Preadventure, perhaps, maybe, God will grant them repentance. Do you realize that when you backslide or when, see, and, 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 and be cautious with this. Because some of you think you got to go out there and commit fornication and all of that to backslide. Oh, no, you don't. You can just have something in your heart against someone and backslide. You can just be disobedient. You can, you can uh, uh, be guilty of the sin of omission and backslide. God can tell you to do some things and you won't do them. That's a backslidden saint. Are you hearing God? So he said, teach them. Instruct the ones that are opposing themselves. They're working against themselves. Maybe, perhaps, maybe God will grant them repentance. Do you know how frightening it is to be away from God? Let me tell you something, saints. You know what ought to frighten us? The prospect that I might not get back. I may have some iniquity in my heart, and God don't let me get it right. I might cross that line of demarcation where God is finished with me. I might get to a place where God says, I don't, I don't, I don't account you as the seed or as the children. Yeah, you got my spirit. You had my spirit in you. But you don't bring forth fruit, so I'm cutting you off. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit is cut off by the Father, says Jesus Christ. You may cross that line with God where God has given us time. and time. How many of us can testify that God has, has given us chance after chance after chance after chance? How many times have we gone to the altar to repent? Glory to God, laid in our beds and repented, fell on our faces and repented, driving down the highway, repenting for things that we did. Supposing God didn't give us an opportunity to do that. Supposing God said, not today. I'm done with you. I'm done. I don't want to hear anything else. And don't you ever think that you can't get to that place because you can. I've had two people in this ministry that got there that I know of. And they died there. They couldn't get back. They couldn't get back. They couldn't. And I remember telling one of them every year for 25 years. Can you imagine telling a person the same thing for 25 years and they don't do it? Suffering with them. Suffering at their hand doing all kind of treacherous and devious things against me. And I, I you know, and I can, I, I, I thank God that I can stand before God and say I never retaliated. The only thing I would ever do is come back to that person and say, get your heart right. They say, oh, Pastor, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean to do it, Pastor. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Okay, just get your heart right. Don't die like that. Get your heart right. Every year, get your heart right. Your heart is not pure. It's not pure. It's not pure. Sanctify yourself. Your heart is full of stuff. It's full of stuff. And I watched God. Nothing I heard. I watched God turn that person over to their own mind. Couldn't get back. Can you imagine being saved for 25 years? And then a few weeks before you die, you can remember everybody but God. You remember everything and everybody else but God. Can you imagine that, Judy? Knowing everybody but God. You've been in the church 25 years. Preaching his gospel. Leading people to the Lord. Helping establish churches. Come on. And your end is you don't even remember God. You can talk about everything but God. Do you pray, preacher? Nah. 
You don't talk to God? Not like I used to, no. This is someone, glory to God, that if I came in the room, if I came in the house, wherever I was, they were going to find me and they are going to get in a conversation about God. Now, all of a sudden, they don't even, they don't even know anything about God. Don't know, don't, don't. Walking around. And God turned that person over to their own mind. Don't let that happen to you. Because God was <laughs> finished. Finished. See, you can, you, if, 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 let me, let me just bring it on home to you, saints. Whatever your character is, you know it. I said to a lady once, she and her husband were sitting before me for counseling, and I said to this lady, I said, you're mean. I said, you're very mean. And she looked at her husband, she said, honey, I'm mean. He said, yes, ma'am, you are. Really? And I said to my son, I didn't want to know she mean. She mean. She mean. She just mean and hateful. Hard to get along with. Judgmental. If you know you judgmental, change it. Stop being judgmental. Let's get rid of that gap, that gulf that separates us from God. Because I don't want God to I don't want God to look at me and say, that's enough. I done warn you over and over and over again and you still won't obey. And you know it don't have to be the fornication and the adultery and all that stuff you're thinking about. It can just be what are you look, looking at on television? I told you don't watch that stuff. And you just continue to watch it. It satisfies your flesh, but it but it offends my spirit, says God. And you're all right with that. You're all right with my spirit being offended. Hallelujah. You're all right with it. Repent before I cut you off. Think about those things that we have allowed to be that great gulf that separate us from God. Think about it. Anybody can think about things that you know in your life? Is there is a gulf to separate you from God? Think about it. And say, God, I'm getting rid of that. I'm getting rid of that. Some, one of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen is, uh, is offense. The most ridiculous things I've ever seen is for a person to sit in the church day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, offended. Offended. It would be better, glory to God. See, because it's an affront to the Holy Spirit. Let me, let me show you why people, people have such, uh, and this is not to big up nobody or nothing or me or ministry, Bible teachers, nothing. But let me give you a, a principle here. If, if God deal with you through his leaders, if he deals with you and he chasten you and he say, look, Sit right here till you learn, till you submit. Come down. Come, come on down off that horse. Come on down. Sit, sit right here. Sit and learn. Get perfected in my spirit. If that's the way God deal with you, you ought to raise your hand and tell God, thank you. Because he hasn't, he hasn't gotten rid of you yet. He hasn't, he hasn't ridden you off. He's still giving you an opportunity to, to, to develop yourself spiritually. Hmm? But if God do that with you, Ricky, and you get offended, if God come to you, glory to God, and, and, and point out character that you know you have, bad character, that you know you have, because, see, that all that stuff, is, is, <laughs> I tell, tell these people, preachers, some things we don't waste time with. If I come to you and say, now, nah, Marie, now you know you're intimidating, you know you, you got that streak, that, that snap, and that da-da-da-da-da, and people intimidated by you, 
You know that because you know that's what you operated in. Is that not right? So why would you get offended with me if I call you in their office and say, say, Marie, now this is detrimental now to the position that, you're, that, you, that, that we, you were slated in. This can be a stumbling block to the people that you got to serve. I need you to sit. I need you to step out of that position and sit down and, until that character change. Why would you be offended with me? Would you rather stay in that position and hurt the people that you're supposed to be leading and ministering to? Be a, be a stumbling block to them? Would that, would, is that more preferable? Are you hearing God? So now, the most ludicrous thing I've ever seen is for someone like that to sit and be offended Offended, offended every day, every day after that, every day after that, you come to church, every service, sit, sit down, listen to Dr. Banks, or listen to Bishop Lorna, or listen to some of these other ministers, and still offended, 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 offended. Let me tell you why that's dangerous in here. You know why that's dangerous to do that in here? Because the Holy Ghost works in here. That's why. That's why. It's dangerous, glory to God, to come in offended, walk out offended. Come in offended, walk out offended. Come in offended, walk out offended. That's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing to look narrowly upon God's leaders. That's a dangerous thing, saints. That's dangerous. See, so many people have been in churches where the spirit is not moving. He's not in charge. But that's not so in here. The Holy Ghost is changing people in here. The Holy Ghost is making us better. Come on, saints. The Holy Ghost is working. The word is, 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 is digging up that fallow ground and, 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 and new seeds are being planted, seeds of righteousness. And we're preferring that. That's the work of the spirit. That's not a woman. That's not a woman. That's the work of the spirit. So it's very dangerous to sit in, in the midst of the Holy Spirit and be an affront to him. That's a dangerous place to be. It's dangerous to sit and look narrowly upon the ministers of God. That's dangerous. Very dangerous. And sometimes people wonder, why? Why? Why is this happening in my life? Why is that happening? Why is this going on? They don't connect the dots. It's the way you entertain the spirit of God. Hallelujah. I want you to think on those things now that are gaps in your life. Guffs. Anybody got any guffs? That's separating them from God? I had some saints. I, you know, God, see, see when God, when God talk, he's talking to everybody. I had to, when I, when I preached this lesson, before I preached it, I had to look and see where's my gulf. If I, do I have a gulf here? I had to find those little those little foxes, Marie, that 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 you think is no harm and, and uh uh. Yes, they are, cause they're not Christ. They're not Christ. So whatever it is, whatever it is, if you got that gulf. If you got that great guff, if you think you got a little guff, you need to tell God, I'm through with it today. I'm getting rid of it today. I'm not, hallelujah, I am not going to rest there anymore. I'm not going, I'm not going to relax right there anymore. I'm not going to relax right there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm changing this thing today. I'm getting this not going to stand between me and God. This is never going to stand between me and God anymore. Hallelujah. Come on, saints. Glory to God. This is not going to stand between me and God anymore. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Those of you that are watching by way of television, this is your opportunity. If you know that you got a gulf, between you and God, let's get rid of it. If it's the way you think, if it's the way you deal, if it's your attitude, whatever it is, the deeds, whatever they are, glory to God, get rid of it today. This is your chance to say, God, have mercy on me. God, have mercy on me. God, have mercy on me. Hallelujah. 
this is your chance. Those of you that feel that you need to come to the altar, this is your chance. You can come if you want to come. Those of you that want to just make your chair an altar, you can do that too. I want to ask Dr. Leverage to come and finish our call. Those of you that are watching by way of television, this is Dr. Banks saying, I hope that this word has penetrated your heart. I hope that you have been ministered to today. We're going to continue along these lines in this book, The Great Gulf. We're going to destroy those things that separate us from God. This is Dr. Banks saying, we'll see you next time. Praise you, Jesus. Dr. Leverage. Hallelujah. 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 Have we heard the Lord? Have we been hearing the Lord? Have we been searching our own lives? Um, 